Hello Aurora lovers, this is Dale Bone from Dale Bone Imaging and this is Aurora Hunting 101. This is episode 13, What is the BZ? The first acronym that most new Aurora hunters encounter is the KP. Uh, BZ is often the second. So what is the BZ and why does it matter? First let's look at the symbol. BZ is not an acronym. The letter B is used by physicists to represent magnetic fields and equations. In this case it represents the magnetic field carried by the solar wind, also known as the interplanetary magnetic field or the IMF. Since the magnetic field is three-dimensional, there are three components representing three different directions labeled X, Y, and Z. Uh, so you have BX, BY, and BZ. So if you, you know, you can think of the three directions as, you know, this might be BY, this might be BX um, pointing towards the sun, and then BZ is north-south relative to the earth. And when, say, the pen is in its normal alignment with north to north, the there's less interaction between the solar wind and the Earth's magnetic field. When it's reversed, it does tend to cause disturbances and allow for interactions between the magnetic fields. You can think of it as when you ever, if, you, if you've ever played with magnets um, and you try and push two North Pole magnets, two North Poles of magnets together, they resist it. And it's really hard to do. Uh, but if you have a north and south, they just snap together. So when those fields are misaligned, that's when you get a lot more transfer of energy between the magnetic fields. So there is a fourth um, letter. There's a, also a B T. In that case, T is the total, so that's the total strength of the magnetic field. Um, stronger fields are better, but other than that. Uh, it's not uh, not that important um, and we also don't care about the BX and BY components because they don't really affect the, the Aurora and most websites don't show them or they show them as a combined uh, angle. So why does BZ matter? Uh, like I said when BZ is positive then the solar wind mostly flows uh, past the Earth without interacting very much. If BZ is negative, it's misaligned with the Earth's magnetic field and you get much more uh, interaction and it disturbs Earth's magnetic field, allowing more of the energy to, transferred to be transferred from the solar wind into the Earth's magnetosphere. The result is more auroral activity. The aurora, auroral oval tends to expand further south if you're in the north, um, and as and it's especially true if you have a sustained negative BZ for of more than one hour or even longer. So let's take a look at a video to help visualize this a little bit. So I want to show a little clip uh, from this video. Uh, it shows the interaction between a negative BZ and the Earth's magnetic field and it's one of the best examples I've been able to find. Um, I have shown this video before, but uh, <laughs> maybe you haven't watched all of my videos, so let's, let's just take a quick look at it. When the solar storm reaches our planet, something strange happens. An invisible shield, the Earth's magnetic field, deflects the... So here, you, they're showing the two magnetic fields, the blue uh, magnetic field with the arrows pointing up for the Earth and the incoming one 
as part of the solar storm they're saying or this uh, coronal mass ejection uh, with a negative BZ pointing the opposite direction and that allows this interaction between the magnetic fields to inject more energy slash particles um, into the Earth's magnetic field uh, which gets funneled down into the upper atmosphere generating stronger aurora displays. So let's play the rest of this. Storm. Song. The magnetic fields couple together and create a funnel where the gas streams down on the daylight side of the pole. This is the daylight aurora. The magnetic fields stretch further back and couple together. The magnetic rubber band breaks and gas from the solar storm streams along the magnetic lines. So when the BZ is positive and the magnetic fields align, uh, there is still interaction, there is still uh, energy transfer between the solar wind and the Earth's magnetic field. It's just not as strong. This uh, fact that they're talking about here where the, the material or the energy gets pulled directly into the Earth's magnetic field only happens when the BZ is negative as far as I'm aware. Uh, and that's um, when you tend to get stronger aurora display. Certainly for a given KP they'll be much stronger if there's a strong negative BZ towards the poles on the night side. This is the nighttime aurora. Hopefully that helps you visualize a little bit of what's going on. Like I say with the positive KP that animation would be different. It would show mostly um, solar wind just flowing past the earth. Given BZ's importance to the strength of the aurora, most apps and websites uh, display the BZ values. Let's take a quick look at spaceweatherlive.com. So let's take a quick look at spaceweatherlive.com. I sort of hesitate to use Space Weather Live, but it's, it's got lots of information which is both good and bad because some of the information is not applicable, or much of the information is not applicable to aurora hunting. Um, but it does have a vast variety of information related to the sun and the Earth's magnetic field. So if we go on to spaceweatherlive.com or the app and scroll down to real-time solar wind information. So this is information being monitored by the Discover satellite here and it sits out at the L1 Lagrange point which is quite a ways from the earth but it's between the sun and the earth and right now it takes 54 minutes for the solar wind to get from that satellite to the earth uh, and that time time is based on how fast the solar the speed of the solar wind, so if the wind speed is higher, say 600, it'll take less time for that to happen and there'll be less advanced information in terms of uh, what is going to impact the Earth. Uh, it's got the density, uh, 2 is pretty low, 500 is pretty slow for the wind. Uh, when uh, there's a storm happening, uh, it could easily be 30 minutes although that, that would have to be fairly strong. Um, density of 10 is not unusual. Uh, and, uh, interplanetary magnetic field, so that's the BT, that's the overall magnetic field, not broken down into the X, Y, and Z components, or Z components, yes, Z components. Uh, and then finally is the BZ, and as I said, this is the overall strength, the BZ is always going to be less than that. Like it's, it's never going to be more than, if this is six, then the plus and minus values of the BZ will never be more than six. So right now you can see that it has been positive. 
and then it has swung negative. Now the problem is a negative one or negative two is not very strong. You can think of that, uh, um, like the overall field is close to six and it's minus two, so that's not very much of the overall magnetic field, right? It's when it's uh, more strongly negative that uh, we would expect more of an interaction and stronger or this will help but um, it's certainly not as negative as I would like if I was out hunting. Um, we can also look at the same information on uh, the NO website. So the Space Weather Enthusiasts dashboard has much of the same information, uh, although this is a little more aurora focused, but it is a general space weather information site. So people that do amateur radio and solar observing and all sorts of things are also interested in this information and um, or similar information. Uh, so And this website includes all of it. Um, solar flux is flares off the sun, geomagnetic activity is the history of the Kp values. We had this unexpected Kp5 a day or two ago. Fortunately it was a night here. If you go down to the solar wind we get that same information that was on spaceweatherlive.com. So the top one is BZ, actually BZ and BT. So the red one is, part is, the graph is the BZ, and you can see how it buzzes back and forth. And BT is the overall one. Time scale is longer, so we've got more of the graph. So basically, the, this one, one goes from 21 to 21. So this is a 24 hour graph. The other one was four or five hours. Phi, I'm not even 100% certain what that one is. I think it's a combination of the BZ, BX and BY values. Um, density, we looked at density on the other one. The density is pretty low. And then the speed again, and the speed looks like it's slightly trending down. Temperature wasn't on the uh, spaceweatherlive.com site, but it doesn't have that much of an effect. And of course, there's many, many other chunks of information and interesting pictures and things like that on this website. But uh, at some point, I will probably do a video on just this website and explain a little bit more what all the things are. But uh, I don't want to get dragged into that just now. In episode 12, I talked about hemispheric power or the HPI being the best short-term aurora forecast. It, of course, takes BZ into account, and if you're using HPI, you can ignore BZ. That said, I often look at both. Um, in this episode, we learned that BZ is the north-south component of the magnetic field carried by the solar winds. This is the Interplanetary Magnetic Field, or IMF. When the BZ is negative, it means that the incoming magnetic field is misaligned with the Earth's magnetic field, and it is likely to generate stronger aurora. If you use Kp at night, then you should also look at the BZ value. I recommend just using the hemispheric power index instead. As always, I'll include the links uh, to the sites in the notes. With that, please check out episode, episode 14, What is the Geomagnetic North Pole? And I'm wishing you clear skies and happy hunting.